My next question is, you know, why you made the switch to, you know, transition from a developer to a solution architect? Um, uh, what what motivates you to make this transition? Right. I love I love building stuff. It's really as simple as this. Uh, I love building stuff. And as a developer, you build only your portion of a big application or of a big workload. And with time, I found myself wanting to know more about the application. I don't want to just build my own feature and maintain it. I want to build this whole section. And then I want to build this whole domain. And then you know what? I want to also design this feature. I don't want to just get requirements. And then you know what? I want to, uh, now I think I have enough experience building, designing. Well, I want to go even upstream, one level up and talk directly with these stakeholders and understand their realities. And so it was, it was, it was a, a, uh, a, a transition that came through different, like it took me six, seven years to get to the, to, to, to the, to the point where I was like, I think I have enough knowledge to try to architect a whole application from the get-go. And and I, I think like I, I talk with a lot of people and they want to become solution architects, you know, right out of school. And people are different, you know, everyone is, is different, of course. But I always go back to Andy Jassy's, you know, Amazon uh, uh, CEO's quote where he says, there is no compression algorithm for experience. Sometimes you can be the smartest person but sometimes but you need to fail and by fa- like you learn a lot from failures and so you know in in my opinion there's some there's some experience that you need to have there's some uh, some failures that you need to go through there's some walls that you need to bash your head against there's some uh, uh um policies that you need to work around like there's a lot of things to learn before you can be able to provide uh you know and an, uh, before you can succeed in this role just keep it that simple and so after nearly a decade i was like well i think i have what it takes right now spoiler alert i didn't <laughs> but it took me a little uh, you know a lot more mm-hmm. to learn uh, a lot of things that I was missing and you don't know what you don't know uh, but i but I, I was thinking to myself well i've done back end development i've done front end development i've done uh, um, everything around databases i've deployed stuff to the cloud on prem i've done migrations i've worked with business i've managed i've done product now it's time to you know try to combine all of these things into a daily job and i couldn't find any other position that describes or that gathers all these things uh, than the social architecture position. And I was super happy when, you know, the because back in maybe five, six years ago, there was not a solutions architect role. We used to talk about software architect, we used to talk about enterprise architect, systems architect, right. but a solutions architect was not a role. And so I was happy when, especially with the advancement of the cloud, we started seeing this role getting, uh, uh, you know, a bit more out there. And uh, I was like, yes, that's that's the role that I want to see myself doing for the future. And that's pretty much it. Got it. Um, now, my next question is, you know, what are some challenges for being a solution architect? You know, because you worked at, you know, both sides of the table. You were a software developer before. Uh, you're also a people manager, uh, manager before, like, you know, managing software developers. And also you were a tech lead before. Um, so how is it, you know, different compared to solution architect? Like, what are some challenges that, you know, that people have to consider, you know, when they transition? to a solution architect? Good question. Yeah, unfortunately, when I was a, a software developer, and and regardless of how a great software developer you are, by definition, you are given and you are focused on one aspect of the application. And if the application is super big, then you know one small feature. But if the application is small enough, well, you're still focused on one aspect of the application, but also one technology or a set of technologies. Because as a developer, you can't allow yourself to say, "I'm gonna." I write this feature in Node and, the, and this different feature in PHP and this other feature, the microservice, I'm going to write it in Java, right? You can, but should you? <laughs> because you're spending a lot of time building these interfaces between these different technologies and trying to make them work together, but that's not your job. Your job is pretty much, at the end of the day, converting those business requirements to, if you're working for a profitable company, to a money-making feature, right? Shouldn't, shouldn't, we're not doing yeah. technology for the sake of doing technology. We're not, we're, 
like as but as engineers sometimes we fell into this this uh, uh mistake of of doing some engineering work just for the sake of doing engineering work that's something i noticed also when i was a a, a, a team lead like and 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 an, an managing um a team of people from different that have different background and different experience levels and you can see that some some uh some engineers would want to embark in an engineering work like in updating a framework or you know what we've been using this library to parse csv files but hey there's this new library that just came out and it's perfect and it's cool it has this new features i want to take time in my sprint to migrate to it and then i had to stop and say okay but why like what is is there a business requirement there or are we doing this engineering work just for the sake of doing engineering work i don't want your viewers to, to get me wrong keeping your stack up to date is mandatory um but see there's there's this book i read a while ago and i i i, I advise i suggested always uh it's called the phoenix project it's a very simple book very straightforward and and it puts words on some concepts that we use a lot in software engineering and we just don't think about them and for example in the book they say that there are four types of work in in IT there are engineering work so upgrade a framework install a patch on your server um, choose a different library there's business work right that's implementing a new feature that's the things that make that uh, uh, bring more money to the company there is daily work writing jira tickets replying to your emails being on slack and and talking to other like going to meetings this is work that we do every day and, and the fourth is what they call unexpected work and that's you know the silent killer that's when you get a requirement at the end of the sprint that's when something goes down and you have to put everything on the side to fix it that was the big when there's a big bug so i tried to keep these things in mind and in while i was a software engineer i found out that, that a lot of times i was mostly focused on uh, my daily work and my engineering work and they only did business work if there's a new requirement but once you take that step back and you start looking at things from the perspective of a product manager or from perspective of a campaign marketing campaign manager or from, from a perspective of a, uh, of a, I don't know someone who's who's uh, works in in business you know there's, there's a ton of positions there and you start you get that you know start to understand the dynamics uh, 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 there and and you're like okay we can take two months to migrate this uh, uh, workload to this new framework and that's gonna take this much time but what is the return on investment yes my engineer will be happy but at the end of the day uh, uh, we want to be able to iterate faster. We want to be able to build features that our customers uh, um, expect us to build. We want to get actually customers' feedback and we want to, that's something that I loved about AWS. You know, 90% of their features are based on customers' feedback. And as a solutions architect, you are expected when you are working with uh, these companies, these customers, you're expected to get their feedback and then bring it back to services team, to people who build these EC2, S three Lambda services and tell them, well, you know what? Customers don't like this feature. Or you know what? Customers want our SQSQ to have a FIFO feature or want our SNS to have a FIFO feature. And so that's also part of the responsibility of a solutions architect, being that liaison between product, business, and then engineering. And I think this is something that sometimes software engineers or developers miss because they don't have direct, uh, um, uh, I would say, direct interaction with who uses their uh, features, not all of them. I would say great software engineers, they're the first one to try their features. They're the first one to eat their food, their dog food, you know. Uh, but a lot of software engineers, they focus only on optimizing the software, optimizing the feature, regardless of what the feedback is coming from outside, what the feedback is coming from stakeholders that are within, uh, that are whether, you know, inside uh, uh, the company or outside the company mm, right yeah that's 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 something that i've noticed a lot yeah mm -hmm. um and and yeah and priorities right what to prioritize yes we want mm. our things to have the latest uh libraries and whatever but every business every industry every vertical have their own priorities and you have to uh to keep those always in mind mm. got it yeah. um so my next question is just characteristics to really understand you know in your point of view you know what are some skills or characteristics that you know every solution architect must have um or in other words like who is this job for um uh, what kind of people should be able to uh should fit in this category um yeah 
Great question again. Um, okay. In no particular order, I believe a good solutions architect is someone who is a quick learner, is someone who is able to dive deeply in a given problem and try to learn as much as they can around it, around the whole ecosystem, not only technical, but around the business, right? You're working with a clinic, with a, with a physician. And so you're able to, and, and they're looking to, I don't know, upgrade their infrastructure. Um, you're, you should be knowledgeable and you should be able to learn about compliance in the medical field, about encryption that uh, you know, follows whatever, you know, for example, uh, uh, HIPAA compliance, right? You, you need to build a, a, an architecture that is compliant to uh, HIPAA and follow whatever encryption algorithms that need to be encrypti encrypted, whatever new protocol that needs to be used whenever. And so this is this is different for every industry. If you're building something for SpaceX and you need to, uh, uh, you know, transfer data, I don't know, from the moon to Earth, then you're using a different set of technologies, protocols, encryption, latency is different, data storage is different. If you're building an application that runs on the web, it's a completely different thing. So you need to be able to, to, to. Well, I would also say be a good listener, you know, <laughs> and just listen to people, understand their uh, uh, everything that they're trying to say, but also everything that they couldn't say and connect the dots, right? Experience, as we said, there's no compression algorithm for experience. You need to be someone who is experienced, experienced in as many technologies as you can. Sometimes you can be a specialist in one field, a specialist in containers, specialist in live streaming, a specialist in HPC and high performance computing. That's completely fine. Um, but you need to be able to connect the dots that yes, you can build you know a containerized application, but you would know that if this application needs to interact with a serverless application, then exactly it needs to follow this design pattern, this best practices, these guidelines, use this technology, stuff like that. Um, another thing that I believe a successful, a good solutions architect should have is uh, to focus. <laughs> but I think this goes for a lot of pretty much everyone who works in software engineering, but this ability to just put on headphones for a few hours and dive into your whiteboard, dive into and try to juggle with all these components that you have and all these requirements that every component has and try to build as, you know, th this, this, uh, this um, architecture that that follow and respects every one of these components. So ability to focus for at least, I would say, long periods of time, at least four, five, six hours per day. I would say just, you know, focus on one task that is super important. Um, to have a so uh, soft skills, you know, social skills, because a lot of the work that solutions architects do is face-to-face -face with customers, with stakeholders. As, so as, as developers, uh, I, I used to spend my day in front of my computer, writing my features. Of course, we had stand-ups and stuff like that, but this is just within my team, right? But as social architect, you're meeting new people every time. You're meeting new people from different backgrounds, from different levels at the company, and you need to be able to talk their language, explain things to them in a way that the message is not lost, understand their language, um, understand, like putting yourself in their shoes. Uh, uh, you talk with a CFO, probably all they want to know is cost cost, cost, cost. How much is going to cost me? How much money I'm going to get on that? Am I going to be able to uh, justify this investment, right? You talk with um, a product, is is it going to, someone from products, you know, they're going to ask around how quickly am I going to be able to go to markets with this solution? Um, how much man hour is going to take me to build this solution? Do I have enough capacity? Uh, you talk with UX, is it different? How, how, what's the latency is going to be for this specific design? Is my uh, is, is the user going to be frustrated using this application because they need to wait for three seconds after they push on a button because the backend service need to do a ton of or can we do parallel execution to like you need to be able to to talk to adapt your uh, you know your your, your speech to uh, to the audience also presentation skills it probably goes hand in hand with the, with the previous one because again as i mentioned sometimes it's better to do a poc but sometimes it's better to do a powerpoint deck you know mm -hmm. slides um, you need to be able also to keep up to date. You don't want to be, especially if you're, it's, it's a tough working in IT because there's always new things and you always have to be up to date. And, and especially with these cloud providers,
providers. There's there's a ton of features that get released every week, and and you should be able to say to go back to your customers and say, hey, you guys, um, you have this need. You want to build this feature, but you know what? If you just wait a couple of months, this AWS is launching this new feature that will scratch your itch, and you don't have to build it yourself, right? So you have to be always up to date uh, around around pretty much everything that's happening uh, on the cloud. Having a technical background helps a lot. You can be a solutions architect, believe it or not, without having a programming background. But that, that I think is, uh, uh, it, it's not, you can't be a solutions architect in all companies without having the, 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 the technical background. Only a few companies allow you or offer this possibility like AWS, uh, because there's also a pre-sales uh, a requirement to the job, right? And you could work with a team of, you know, with an army uh, that you could uh, get involved every time you need to do deep dives mm-hmm. uh, that are technical. But in the majority, you need to have uh, that technical background because also you want to establish credibility. Imagine you're working with the team of 10 people and you're recommending them to use this database rather than this database. People respect uh, uh, competence. People respect quality of work. People don't respect titles. You know, you can't say, hey, I, I am a solutions architect and I tell you to use this. So it's the best way. It doesn't work like that. It's way better when you say, well, this is why I think it's the best technology for the job. It's because it has this uh, features and it, it helps us with these limitations. And I have this experience building it for this use case. And this is what I have learned. So this goes a long way. 